just do a little bit of the housekeeping and then we will get started here. There's so many of you are coming in uh, right now as we speak. So thank you, Mike, for uh, hitting that record button. Um, this is my contact information. Uh, that's my direct phone number. Uh, that's my personal website, as well as if you want to follow me on any of the social platforms, you can find me there. And if you need to email me uh, regarding anything on this, um, certainly on this webinar around remote work, or if there's any way that I can help uh, anyone going forward, we certainly realize what a difficult time this is. Um, as soon as people started getting sent home, my email box, uh, which is already relatively full, got absolutely slammed. My phone was off the hook, people asking for advice on managing their people or how to set up their offices or what to do. Um, we feel so privileged to hear People G2 to be in a position to share what we know and to talk about our uh, sort of our best practices, how we got into this situation, and really uh, what remote work can do for you. And I think even though some of you may be scared, you may be uh, uncertain about what's happening, uh, this could be really a great opportunity for you to get a whole lot of work done in a lot less time. Uh, we find that remote work to be so much more fulfilling uh, and to be really a better way to work, but it takes a certain amount of uh, preparation, a certain amount of skill, and a certain amount of strategy. And I'm going to share those things with you today. As we go through this, if you have questions, please put them in there. I do have a dedicated question time about four-fifths of the way through the presentation, uh, and I will stay on and answer uh, questions afterwards for anyone who has them as well. Um, and if for some reason we can't get to your question, we will certainly uh, follow up with you directly. But if you have questions, please feel free to, to put them in as we go along. Again, as I mentioned early at the beginning of this, we will be sending out the recording of this presentation, and you are more than welcome to share this with uh, whoever in your uh, community, in your company, in your network, whoever might need help. We certainly want you, we want to be that, that resource for everybody. So I think we've given everyone a good amount of time here to pop in and get going. So let me go ahead and start the presentation. Um, again, my name is Chris Dyer. I am the CEO of People G2. I have, I'll tell you a little bit about me in a moment, but I want to start with uh, my company, uh, People G2. Um, we started, uh, actually I started coming back in 2001, but from 2001 until about 2009, I don't think anyone had ever really heard of us. I mean, we were just sort of, you know, going along like a lot of small companies do. And we really started to have massive growth and really became a much larger organization. Uh, and we began to get attention and become a best workplace uh, and all over the place and began, uh, we were on the Inc. 5000's fastest growing list four times now. And, you know, you can find us all over the web. And I really attribute this to a few things. The first is we decided to go remote in 2009. And by we, I mean I decided the company was going to go remote. And we did this for cost-saving measures. Um, the recession had hit, the financial markets were crazy, and we were in a very uncertain time. Sound familiar? And um, we decided that one of the things we could do to keep our employees was to lower our cost significantly by sending everyone home. And I had had a really good mentor, Kim Shepard, Decision Toolbox, and they had done this as well already. And so we decided this seemed like a good idea and we were going to do it. And along the way, we figured out, A, how we have to work is totally different, but B, this was a way better way to work. And in fact, we really had to focus on our culture and this, there were so many awesome things that came out of this. So we really did this for a cost savings reason, for a very practical reason, much like a lot of you are having today that you're going home because of a very practical reason in helping our communities and making sure we're not spreading uh, this virus or, or, or causing this pandemic to be any worse. Um, but there are some really awesome things that may come out of this in this new working environment for you. Um, again, uh, just sort of to kind of tell you a little bit more about me, I do speak around the world, around, the, around on employee engagement, on company culture, on remote work, uh, and I've written a book, The Power of Company Culture. And in fact, a lot of things that we're going to talk about today are of interest to you. If you like them and you wish you could know more, you can find my book on Amazon or wherever you buy books and you will have everything you need. There's sort of a deep dive in a lot of this, and it's more the book's sort of written more as a resource manual than anything else. So 
uh, feel free to check that out if that's something that interests you. Um, inside the book, we focus on these pillars. And these seven pillars are the things that the greatest companies do on a consistent basis really, really well. And this is why they're considered good. This is why they are the leaders in their market, because they are really good at transparency. They are really good at being positive, having positive leadership, um, otherwise known as appreciative inquiry. Uh, they know how to measure well. And measurement is a really, really big deal when you have people working remote. As I'll talk about in a minute, you can't, you know, if you assume people are doing a good job because they dress nice and they run around the office and they talk to lots of people and you hear their stapler going and papers rustling, you're not measuring very well. And great companies know they need to measure in a much better way. And it doesn't matter if you can see them doing the work or not. It doesn't matter if they're spending a certain amount of time at their desk or not. It's results-based uh, leadership and results-based management. And that's a huge key here. Um, celebrating what makes us unique how we recognize our employees, listening, which is a huge one for going remote, uh, and then how do we deal with mistakes. So these are the really big concepts of the book, and they are paramount to any company wanting to be great, but especially a remote organization. All right, we have a quick poll question, and we hope it's going to work here. It's the first time we've ever decided to run a poll, but I'm just sort of curious, how many of you are doing this remote thing for the first time? So if you see a poll, Oh, there, the poll just popped up, and you should be able to answer there. We have about a minute uh, for questions to pop in, and we'll get the results. Uh, but how many of you are doing this remote thing for the first time? Would love to know. Go ahead and hit yes or no and submit. Um, and I think in a minute we will find out the answer to that poll, just to kind of get an idea of where everyone's at. Um, that really would be helpful. So go ahead and answer that, and we will move forward here. So originally my talk was going to be remote success, how my team beats your team in their pajamas. And this is kind of a joke because we would never work in our pajamas, but just this idea, this is what people think of when they think of remote work. And of course, with the uh, change and what's happening in our, in our world, we are gonna, I have reworked this presentation and we're gonna focus today on, um, you know, working remote, you know, all the time or maybe just for a bit. So really focusing on helping anyone who's remote be more effective. And I'm kind of changed it a little bit to really make sure we're gonna help those of you that maybe are, are new to this. But certainly we'll still talk about the big concepts even if you are a remote pro. All right, so there are many different types of remote uh, uh, people. And so it's really important for us to kind of get through this. There are the digital nomads, these are the people that you see on some stock photo with their computer sitting in Bali and they you know, work three hours a day and they do some really cool thing and then they just live wherever they wanna live. This is not who we're talking about today. They can use these strategies, but we're not talking about a digital nomad. Um, work from home, so you know, all of my employees are work from home. In fact, I'm with the exception of now being on travel restriction, I'm probably the only one that's like on the road a lot more, a little closer to that digital nomad to working wherever. But for most people working in a single place every single day, that's who we're talking about today. That's who we're really focused in on. Um, there's also people who do remote work as part-time side hustle. So Uber drivers, Postmates, um, maybe they're a freelancer, maybe they do a little bit of web work you know, on the side. So that, that they're a little kind of close to work from home, depends on if they have a, a singular place to work every day. But that is a little different as well. And then of course, offsite, and people don't think about this, but you know, plumbers, electricians, your HVAC repair people, um, construction, anyone who does work in a, you know, offsite in a, they're in a new location all the time, they're remote workers. And we just, we don't often think of them that way, but they are remote workers, but again, we're not specifically focusing in on their challenges today. We are looking at for those of you working from home or in a single place, whether it's a WeWork or whatever, but you, you go somewhere, but it's not with other people in your company, you're kind of on your own uh, location. So before I get to, and I promise this is gonna happen very quickly, we will get there uh, on just some of the very specific tips. I wanted to at least for a moment expose you all to what are some of the reasons why remote work is great and why is it important? Um, and it looks like the poll answers came back and we have about, uh, let's we'll say a third of you, this is a brand new thing and two thirds of you have done this before. So that's great to know, it's good information, thank you. Um, so 
76% of millennials would take less money for flexible work. If you work remote, you can offer flex work. You can allow people, uh, my, my staff very commonly will come in, work four hours, and then they got to go do something. Maybe they got to take their kids to school or they go pick them up so they have an hour off and they come back and then they work a certain amount of hours. So they, we can break that up in a way that makes sense for their lives. I have some people that would rather work from 2 o'clock in the morning to 6 o'clock in the morning. Great. You know, there are jobs when we may have, maybe need to have certain hours of collaboration figured out, but for a lot of people, having flex work is super important. I find my remote employees actually get more done and are more productive than they ever were in a traditional office. We have removed all of this sort of um, ridiculous meetings, um, you know, endless chatter around the water cooler, they're just this, you know, kind of unproductive time. And I find for me, I have quiet time to actually get things done, and I don't have people constantly coming into my office. So it's really, really uh, great that way. Um, you know, remote work can help you meet your talent goals on a small budget. So sometimes, you know, companies are maybe hiring in very high cost areas. Um, we're in Orange County, California, so Southern California is that way, maybe hiring in different parts of the country. I could hire this, if I was hiring, let's say, a head of marketing, I could hire a great head of marketing somewhere else where the cost of living is much lower and their salary may be less. And I'm, as a business owner, able to find a great person who can do a great job, let them work remotely, but not have to hire them in a market where I'm going to pay, you know, 40 or 50 percent more. Um, remote, and more. Remote employees are more engaged as long as your culture doesn't suck, and I'll talk about that more later. Uh, of course, it costs less. We don't need to buy as much stuff uh, or feed them or provide their coffee. Um, you know, access to new employee types, we've been able to uh, utilize a lot more stay-at-home parents, uh, military um, spouses, uh, physically disabled, retired, part-time mavens. All these things suddenly become really relevant to us uh, in accessing new people because we allow the remote. Um, we find that re remote employees are 50% less likely to leave. That's a Stanford study, um, and that, that certainly has been true for us. Our employee retention rate is up in like the 98, 97% rate over the last since we started doing this in 2009. Um, and then uh, you know you can extend your hours of operation. So I have customer service people on the East Coast that start when they start, and then I have people you know finishing up the day, and so we're open you know, a much larger amount of time for clients to be able to access us. And of course, we have I, what I think is clear communication and measurement. Now, in 2025, we expect 75% of the workforce to be millennials, and millennials would, in the way in which they prefer to work that has been consistently surveyed over and over again, it actually matches remote work, right? Work anytime, work anywhere, use my own device. All these things are certainly a part of the newer generation that is taking up majority of our workforce over our older generations, uh, which certainly if you, when we survey them, have different priorities for what they look, work to look like. Okay, so be, right before I get to the, some of the really key things, there are some misconceptions about remote work that I did want to address. People often ask, and are they working? If you don't know what your employees are supposed to do, if you don't have clear KPIs, and a clear idea of what success and measurement looks like for them. It shouldn't matter if they're working and sitting in front of a desk or sitting at home. We should have a clear idea and our employees should have a clear idea of what we expect from them and they can go work wherever the heck they want to work as far as I'm concerned. I look at what is that output. Did they meet those goals? Did they meet those KPIs or not? Um, people often ask, what are they doing? They're worried about that. They think they're going to be sitting on the couch and eating bonbons and I don't know, like uh, doing you know, home home repairs or whatever. Again, if we have a clear idea about what we expect people to do, clear access to them, then it's really, really important that um, we give them that trust, right? And so it looks like there might be a question that came in, but I'm not sure how to how to access it. But I will try to get to it. Um, and so. Um, the, oh, there we go. So um, what are they doing is really, really important. So um, it, only if you don't know what they're supposed to be doing. Um, we have to be together to collaborate. Now, there is some research that there are, you know, listen, if, if you work in a, in, a, in a vineyard and you're making wine, you need to be together. 
right? If you're creating an airplane or making a car, yeah, you have to be together. But for most jobs, we don't need to be physically together to collaborate. There are some exceptions. There are certainly some research that an IBM has seen that, you know, bringing people together to co-code can be really good. But there are so many great tools, and it's so easy to do now that collaboration, we find for us, has been way better. And often I've had people say, oh, remote employees are lazy. And I think, again, this is a misconception. I spend more of my time as the leader of this organization getting people to stop working, to, to stay within what is the legal amount of hours, that they're not overworking, um, that they're not showing up on conference calls when they're supposed to be on vacation or taking a day off. I have the opposite reaction to this. Because of workforce, because they have the flexibility to work when they want, it's really important that they stay within those guidelines, and it's really easy for them to kind of go outside of that. So that's actually the opposite problem. It's not that they're not working enough. I have the problem they work too much, um, and we, have to, we certainly talk about that. Okay, so what makes us tick? Now let's get into what are the things that are really important for us to be uh, good uh, remote workers or just good employees in general, I think. Um, so, uh, and there are some great questions coming in. I promise I am going to be hitting some of these for sure. They're already on, on the slide, so uh, stay patient here. Um, but Daniel Pink's work is really important. I always start all of my talks off with this. We need to give people autonomy to do their jobs. And this is exactly remote work, right? You can go do the work where you want, how you want. Okay, now there's some really good best practices, but autonomy is huge. So give the people, here's the box you live in. Now you go figure out how you want to do your work. The more autonomy we can give people, the happier they're going to be and the more productive they're going to be. Mastery that they need to be learning something new. If you can't give them something new to be learning and to be thinking about at work, then at least encouraging them to have that somewhere in their life. That's all that's important. So, if they have a job that's maybe, you know, very simple and they've mastered it in a few days, can they be working, you know, learning guitar at home? Can they have, do have a hobby? They just need mastery somewhere in their life to be happy. And then, of course, do they know what your purpose is? And are they aligned to your company's purpose? This is super, super important. So make sure that we are thinking about um, uh, so much of this as we go through it. Okay. Let's get into the 101. If you have a remote employee who's going remote for the first time, or maybe you're going remote for the first time, here are the key things you had better get right. And we have seen again and again and again, it's so important uh, for remote employees to be successful. First of all, you gotta have a dedicated workspace. If you think you're gonna work on the kitchen table or the living room table, or you're gonna set up a little desk in your bedroom, this will not work. Now. Some employees may have a very small workspace. We've already, I've already had uh, calls from managers saying, listen, my, my uh, employee went home, he's working there with his spouse, the kids are there, they live in a small apartment. It is really tough to have that dedicated workspace, but as best you can, if you gotta like, you know, get a cardboard box or a little mini cubicle or drapes, I and mean, you gotta find a way to create that dedicated space and then tell everyone, listen, you don't come over here, this space is, pretend I'm, at a building miles away. You can't just walk over here and interrupt me because it's super important that you have that dedicated space and time to think. I know and I started the, the presentation off with, you know, we this is the joke about us being in our pajamas, but actually this is a huge thing. We do allow, I mean, every once in a while, if you just need to have one of those days, that's fine. But we find that this sort of act of getting up, shaving, or putting on your makeup, or whatever it is you do in the morning, and getting dressed, yeah, we don't ex we don't expect people to get all in a suit and tie or anything. We're pretty casual in here, but you know, I've got a, a polo on today. I I put on regular clothes. I got dressed. I did what I would have done if I was going into an office. That is, it is a mental thing that makes a really really big difference into how you feel about yourself and your work, and that you don't start to feel like you got cabin fever. Um, also, another thing to do is called sprint and rest. So I really encourage all of my staff, set an egg timer, uh, you know, set a timer on your phone. Go hard for 45 minutes and then get up and go do something else for 15 minutes. Go move the laundry, go walk the dog, go get yourself coffee, let yourself have a mental break. I find 
and this happens with me all the time and all of my remote employees, they will find that they will realize they've been sitting there going hard for two hours, for three hours, and have not moved, have not gotten up because they are working from home and they don't have the natural distractions or people coming over to talk to them. And that can be that can be problematic, right? You need to get up, you need to get be moving. Uh, right now, I'm at a standing desk, so I do like to stand sometimes. But go hard for 15 minutes and then go rest for 15. I guarantee you get more work done doing that way than if you just sat there or like you did in a traditional office trying to do that work. Make sure you protect your time. When uh, people go remote, without a doubt, they suddenly have their spouse asking them to go run errands, their neighbors asking them to watch their kids. Uh, people just asking them to do these things that they would have never asked them to do if they were at a traditional office setting. So pretend that you your office space is just like you're in a, an office and you have your bosses maybe two offices down. You wouldn't be going and running all these errands and doing all these things, right? So you shouldn't do that if you're working from home. So protect your time. Um, if you're supposed to work from this time to this time, that's your work time. You're not going to do other personal things. now. I said get up for 15 minutes and, and give yourself a break, and that's fine. But don't take on other people's things just because you work from home. And I, this sounds like, you know, duh, but I will, you will find so many people start asking you, like, oh, well, you work from home. You can help me with this thing. And you really have to protect yourself. Make sure you go outside. Um, again, this is, seems silly, but it makes a big deal just to go outside for a few minutes. Uh, make sure you don't feel like you're closed in, that you're working inside all the time, uh, especially if you identify yourself as an extrovert a bit more. Um, you can get a little stir crazy if you're inside and you don't, don't go outside at all. Um, make sure you eat your lunch away from your desk, away from your email, away from your phone. Just go have some time to yourself when it's time for lunch. Both this is a legal compliance issue that we people need to be taking their breaks, and we do use uh, Slack for people to clock in and clock out and to, to, to say when they're going to the lunches so we're monitoring and tracking all that from a legal standpoint. Um, there is plugins that you can use for your Slack program, but however you guys want to do it. But it's super important just from a mental state thing. It's really easy to just put your lunch down next to your on your desk and to keep working through your lunch. There are legal reasons that that's problematic. I'm looking at it as more of a human thing. You just get tired and you, you need a break, you need a recharge, and you need to do your best work by giving yourself that time to rest and go do something else. Um, make sure we are using video. So when you're collaborating with people, as much as you can have video calls, the better. There was a study that said that seeing someone else smile releases the same oxytocin as winning, having a winning $20,000 lottery ticket. Now, I don't know if that's exactly true, but even if it's close, seeing someone else smile makes, other pe makes you happy. And so we want to see that's a way to stay connected. It's a way for us to collaborate better, to see the, the, you know, the body language and the facial expressions. We need that. So as much as you can facilitate that, I'm going to give you some technology uh, solutions for this, but we want to have video. Now, sometimes when we use this term, it's called a no mascara day. Um, and everyone uses this, even though I understand uh, there may be some, some, some gender uh, things uh, you know, that kind of go with that. But we just say it's a no mascara day, which means I'm having a bad day. I just didn't feel like getting dressed today. I just didn't feel like doing my hair and putting on my makeup or shaving or whatever it is. And I just don't want to be on video today. We do allow people to do this every, you know, as long as they're not abusing it, not all the time. Sometimes you just have a day that you just don't want to be seen. And if, by giving people that permission that they can do that sometimes, we find it makes a big difference because. Every, it, it sort of, maybe they're sick that day and they're still working, whatever it is, it, it allows them that freedom. Um, as you're sending people home, you may be finding out that they don't have very good internet. You know, that whatever internet they had was okay for stuff they were doing, but now you're doing video calls and screen sharing. You may need to ask them and you have to figure out what your company is comfortable doing. You may need to ask them to go and call their internet company and get that boosted. Um, because, and often they can do that for very inexpensively, uh, especially if this is temporary, you may be willing just to pay for the, the difference, but, you know, they may pay another 10 or $15 like with Spectrum and they get double the internet. That can solve a lot of challenges for you. 
um, you know, make sure you're really taking care of your own mental health. Um, uh, you know, and I'm going to give you some some examples on how we do that here in a minute. Um, but it's super super important. Make sure you know we're on mute and we don't need to be talking, so we cut down the background noises and things like that. Um, and I'm going to get into meeting types, but it's super important as you go remote that we are not meeting one on one all the time. One on one meetings are important for our for our uh, people we're managing, or maybe if you're a person being has a direct uh, supervisor, yeah, you're going to have a one on one. But most of your meetings remote should be in a team system. It should be with multiple people. And this is how we A, ensure collaboration, B, facilitate communication, C, make sure we have transparency. If we're running around having one on one calls, when we discovered this, when we went remote, we realized that people kept calling each other one on one and having these conversations and trying to pass information around. It's like that telephone game when you were a kid, it doesn't go well. And so we stopped doing that and we started collaborating more in group settings and that radically changed how things were being done in our company. So I will uh, go through those here in, here in more depth in just a minute. And we want to have really strict meeting rules, things like starting on time, ending early, and I'll, I'll get into all that in a moment. Um, all meetings must have an agenda. If you don't have an agenda going to a meeting, you shouldn't be going. You shouldn't even be having it. Um, we want to be really strict and curate those meetings so they're really effective and not a waste of people's time. All right, so let's get into technology. What do you use for technology and how to, you know, this is a big question I've been getting. I think I must have had 25 phone calls since this coronavirus thing about what technology do you use? How do my team collaborate? So let me tell you all the best stuff we use. And if it's in bold, that means we use it. That, you, that has the People G2 stamp of approval. That's at least what we use, but use whatever you want. It doesn't matter. Um, I'm not, no one's giving me a cut for any of this, so use whatever you want. Um, we use Slack, and we use Slack because there are so many plugins. We can have people clock, you know, uh, do their time at hours. We can put an FAQ in there. We can start Zoomy. I mean, Slack does everything. So as big or as small as you want to get it, that's the best place to collaborate. Now, other people do use Teams. That's fine. Um, and so for Slack, we're typing. We have little um, rooms in there. In fact, let me show you. Um, I can show you my, uh, my Slack right now. And um, I think I can bring this over. This is my Slack. And so here we have all these different rooms. Our water cooler is where we talk about things publicly. And so, um, you know, we, um, we do that. And then we also, uh, we have team rooms in there, and so people can talk inside of their group. So they're not talking to the whole company all the time. They can talk one on one, and they can start meetings. They can do video calls, audio calls, everything. It's great. It's great for small meetings. If I want to talk to one or two people, I'm going to just start it in Slack. It's super easy. Okay. Um, the second one is Google Hangouts. You can use that, especially if this is just ad hoc for you for a few weeks or months here while this Corona thing is going on. You may just want to use a Google Hangout. It's free, it's simple, you have to use Chrome, um, but you can screen share and you can see each other on video and it's a super easy solution, it's really reliable. Not a lot of tools and things, a lot, a lot of extras, but it's free and easy. So if you just need that, that's great. Um, you can use Vidyard. So Vidyard is a plugin that you put into Chrome. And we use this all the time. You can create a video that shows your screen, it also shows your, your, your face if you want it to, or you can just tape your face. But I, we use it to say, to show people how to do something. We send videos to our clients. We show them how to, they ask us how to do something. We go in and we show them how to do it. We can send them a video. And they can watch the video over and over again until they're comfortable and they understand it. You can also show people, you know, where to do certain things, how to set certain things up. It's a really cool tool uh, to create little videos where people can see your face, see your screen, and then they, they, can, they can, and you just send the link. You don't have to upload anything to YouTube. It, it's super easy. It's like, it, it's, it's idiot proof. Um, then we have Zoom. So Zoom, it can take up to 100 people and a maximum of 45 minute call for free. That is huge. Um, and so that's a great resource. Go-to meeting also has um, options. So if I want to talk to a, my team, you know, five people, seven people, I'm going to do some, a company-wide meeting. We're going to have a bigger Zoom type of thing. Now, if you pay for an account, um, you can have, uh, it goes unlimited. 
So if, if you guys are doing this short term, just one of you could have that, you know, paid account. And when you guys have your larger meetings, then um, that one person can have an unlimited meeting and everyone else who's in there is just a participant and you're good to go. So you can still stay, stay relatively cost effective. But Zoom is great for larger meetings for sure. Um, Uber Conference, Zoho, if you use Zoho, they have meeting options. Um, they're not bad, um, and they have free, uh, Uber Conference also has some free options. We used to have, everyone had an Uber Conference line just to create, but we changed that and we went to Slack because everyone's sort of doing, or Zoom uh, for video meetings. Um, and then for project management, we use Basecamp. We also use uh, Monday. Uh, those are two great options. So when we uh, have, you know, a new client come in, want certain things to be done, automatically sends you notices out to people you can create templates. It's a great way to make sure collaboration is happening without having to, you know, have one-on-one -on -one meetings all the time. Um, and then um, what's really great about all these programs, you know, people work from home. Sometimes their electricity goes out. Sometimes their internet goes out. Sometimes their computer just goes buggy and you can't be there to help them. But all these programs have mobile apps. So you have mobile redundancy and because they have, you know, already have a mobile connection, they can still get on their Zoom call, they can still get on the Google Hangout, they can still be on Slack on their mobile phone, or if they step away from the office, they go to go pick up their child or go to a doctor's appointment, and there's some urgent need, you can reach them. They're still collaborating all the time inside of these different apps. So having mobile redundancy is fantastic. All right, so let's go a step. That was the 101. Let's go into the 201 stuff. And let's talk about motivation. Let's talk about what's going on with people, what they really want when they're working remote. And then we're going to get into the 301, the really high level meeting stuff that I think will be so impactful for everyone here on the uh, webinar today. Um, so this, this gentleman, Dr. Aaron Lee, uh, he, he did, me, did me such a great favor. I didn't even, uh, we didn't even know, but he showed up and said, hey, heard about your company, can we study them for a year? And I said, sure, just don't get in anyone's way too much. He went and did it, I forgot. I even told him he could do it. I forgot he was doing it. And he showed up a year later and said, hey, Chris, thanks again. We've been talking to your people and we studied them and I wanna share these results with you. And I went, oh, I forgot you were even doing this. Wow, okay, well, what were the results? And it was some really, really, uh, mind-blowing stuff that I think you might might be interesting for you to know. So what was studied? These were the different things that we studied that they studied when talking to my people about what made them happy, about what was important to them inside of their work. And what we often think about in remote work is that personal connection is what's missing, right? That personal connection is like the thing you just can't have if you're not working in an office. Well, as it turns out, personal connection was the smallest thing, the least important thing uh, for people. The personal connections are great, but they didn't need personal connection. They needed it, but it was not the most important thing. In fact, it was of this list, it was the bottom. Personal satisfaction is great, but they preferred other things, right? having a family type environment and everyone knows each other, that's great too. But the bigger things, the more important things for their work to feel happy and to feel satisfied, professional satisfaction, that they got the company and their teams were meeting their goals and they were getting things done. That's more than the personal satisfaction, right? That they had some bit of social interaction. So they were interacting with their team, which is different than personal connection. Okay, so they were feeling included in conversations, included in what was happening. We were doing that through all these different meeting types they're gonna get into here in a minute on the 301 section. And then work-life balance was the most important thing. The fact that my employees can go and pick up their kids or go to the doctor or run an errand and they don't have to tell their manager, they don't have to ask permission, they just go. They, they block that time on their calendar Right, but they can still collaborate with us. If we, we really need them, we can still reach them on their phone or through the apps or whatever. But they have this work-life balance is huge. That was the number one factor for them for engagement and happiness. Now, we looked at his premise in this study was that the number of remote workers are increasing, and boy, they've increased in the last week or two. Um, and how would we deal with this 
idea of, you know, would engagement go down? Uh, and we certainly know with all the numbers, I'm sure you guys have all heard about Gallup and how much active engagement, there's only 33% engagement, uh, you know, active engagement's even lower. So, you know, what does that look like? And so inside of our company, all of these different things, remember that pyramid, you know, personal connection they felt was 100%. You know, they could take initiative, that there was feeling like this was a family environment. We all got these great, great scores. You know, did they ever feel unhappy? Sure, some people had felt unhappy. Ever feel isolated, withdrawn? Sure. You know, these, these are normal feelings for people to have, but they were still pretty low. I was pretty, um, pretty surprised. And you know, did they ever feel disconnected? It was. We had some some you know results there we had to think about. But on the engagement side, it said that they were 98% engaged, which blew my mind. The fact that we are 100% remote. Okay, we have 35 full-time people, 3,000 independent contractors who were all surveyed and done in this, right? But they felt 98% engaged was really, really a surprise. Now, we looked at the disengagement numbers, right? Did they ever feel disconnected? Did they ever feel unhappy? And so we did have some things there, and so that brings our overall active engagement number to, um, you know, pretty, pretty high, 67%, okay? But the interesting side note was, that these disengagement numbers about feeling disconnected or unhappy and withdrawn turned out to have come from my newest employees. And when we shared this with our company, I had these new employees call me and say, I'm, it was about six of them, they said, we're so sorry, we think we screwed this up. And I, I said, no, 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 you guys gave honest answers what we want. And they said, but we don't feel that way anymore. We did when we were just starting. And it was a huge like light bulb moment wow, we need to do more to help our new employees feel more engaged sooner um, because they were the ones feeling the most disconnected. Okay, so the overall key findings, you know, again, you know, the, the connectedness was high, the fit, you know, only 13% felt that maybe they didn't, they didn't fit or they felt disconnected. So remote work, as it relates to this study, blew out all of those thoughts, all those people thinking that you're going to be disconnected and you're not going to be able to collaborate and that people won't be happy. That was not the case in this year-long study. So let's talk about the 301. Let's bring it home. Talk about some of the big things. Here's my team yesterday. I said, hey, who can pop on? And these people popped on, my, my best employees. And Karen here was having, when we talked about it earlier, she said, oh, but I'm having a no mascara day. So we said, okay, I thought it worked perfectly for our talk today, but you know, we, we all work from home, we all popped on, and everyone here is inside of a dedicated workspace. Um, so let's talk about how we meet and how teams work. And this is so important. These are some past sort of different, uh, you know, famous types of companies and where they organize, but everyone's moving to this team-based system, and this is very similar to Scrum or Agile. And so the way we work and when we see companies working consistently that are really communicating well, that utilize remote employees, is you have a team. And so let's just say this is your marketing team. Well, someone on this marketing team is also on some other team. Maybe they're also on customer service, or maybe they're in sales, or maybe, you know, whatever it may be, but they're on another team. And then someone from this team is also in this other team. Now, I know this looks like a top-down hierarchy, but it's not. This is a flat situation, but we do ask people who are the members of teams to be in this other team called the scrum of scrum or the team of teams where we talk about the health of our teams and make sure things are going well but this is how we collaborate and we work every day sometimes these teams meet all day long and sometimes they meet once a month it just depends on what that team is and uh, i'll talk about some of those team meetings here in just a second but what makes a great team, and this is super important if you want to have high collaboration, if you want to have it be the right thing inside of organizations. So the anatomy of a great team. First of all, it must be self-forming. If you go around as a leader and tell people, hey, you five people have to be on a team and I want you to go do this thing, you have already set them up for failure. There's a lot of reasons for this, a lot of cognitive biases going into this, but what, instead what you need to do is say, hey, everyone, we're going to create this team. Who would like to be on this team? Now, obviously, if you're creating the sales team, your sales team, sales people will want to be on that team, right? But you may have other people with other um, interests, with other uh, uh, skills and things that are really important to bring in there. But often this is really 
important if we say, hey, we're going to go pick a new CRM. Who wants to be on the new CRM team? Okay. People who have the bandwidth, that have the energy, that have the knowledge, that have the desire to be on that team are the best people to be on that team, not the three or four people who you like best or who you think are your top performers who are totally overworked that you go and shove on that team. Okay. Super important. Five to seven members only. There's a ton of research around this, but our teams work best actually at five is the perfect number. Seven is the maximum. You just can't get stuff done with less or with more. Okay, it's too hard. Jeff Bezos has a great uh, saying that if you can't feed your team with, uh, you know, two large pizzas, there's too many people there. And then and this comes from Google and a lot of their great work. Um, you need to establish unique norms for the team. So every team comes together. Again, let's use a CRM example. They're going to go find a new program and this team comes together. You got five people. They have to answer these three questions before they do any work or they will not be effective consistently. The best teams at Google did this uh, over and over and over again. This was the difference between their good teams and their not as good teams. Number one, they established what does success look like? What would we do? We're supposed to go do this thing. What does success look like? So the sales team would like the CRM. We can afford the CRM. The CEO is going to check off on it. It has to integrate with these five things. Whatever success looks like, they know that before they start. Number two, they talk about failure. Why would we fail? If we did not do a good job, if we did not pick the right CRM, why? and talk about that in advance. So important. And we often don't want to do this. We want to avoid a difficult conversation. We don't want to think about failing, but we need to get this out in the open so we can go around it. You might say, well, geez, we wouldn't have the time. We don't have the resources. We didn't test enough. These are all things we can, we can make sure that we address. And then last but not least, and I think it's probably of the more important, the team must decide how they will deal with conflict. Now, this is up to them. So if you have five people, they might decide a conflict resolution solution is different than some other team you have. And it could be they, they vote. It's purely democratic. They might say, we'll, we'll talk, but the group leader will ultimately make the decision. They might say, we'll bring in an outside manager who doesn't have any stake in the game to help us you know, break the tie. Uh, if we can't you know, come up to it, we'll take it to this other you know, CEO or whoever. They need to have a strategy because teams fail when they don't know how to deal with conflict. Someone's not pulling their weight. They can't you know, agree on what they should do next. They, this needs to be thought about before they start. Very, very important. Okay. And then as we go into these larger meetings, and I talked about the mental health component of this, and we talked about being connected inside of companies, are ways for us to do this. So any meeting that is 30 minutes or more, Start doing this right now. If you guys do this, I swear it will make such a huge difference in your company, in your teams, with everyone that you work with. Meetings under 30 minutes, I, don't, I think it's, it's overkill, but any meeting, 30 minutes or more, do this. And ask everyone, how are you showing up? Just go around the room, okay? And go last. If you're the leader of this group, go last. Ask everyone, hey, how are you showing up? And you're going to hear everything. Geez, I'm really frustrated, or I'm going crazy being stuck at home. My kids are driving me crazy. Um, I have a newborn, and, you know, the a baby didn't sleep all night. I'm really exhausted. Or, geez, I'm super excited to present today. Uh, I have a million things going on. I'm really excited. You get a really good picture of where everyone's coming in mentally, and it allows you to connect and have a moment with them. Go around. And this is not to have a huge conversation, but... You might address it. You might talk about each little thing. If you discover something really big, like, geez, someone just found out they have cancer or their spouse is sick or their grandparent just died, you probably want to stop the meeting and go deal with that, right? Because you're not going to get a good outcome otherwise. Then when the meeting is over, you ask everyone how they're leaving. And that means, like, how are you feeling about the meeting? How do you feel now? Okay, again, it's another great way to connect. You might hear things like, I'm really confused, or I'm really frustrated, I didn't feel like we got anywhere, or wow, this is so great, now I'm really clear, I know where to go. I mean, so you get this, the, the understand from your people where they're really at, okay? And again, make sure you let them share first. If you're the leader of the group, 
If you're the more senior person in the group, go last. Because sometimes if we show up and say we're excited or we're frustrated, everyone else will take on our feelings because they feel pressure to do so. Okay, here we go. This is the big coup de gras here on how do you work remote? So we do several meeting types, okay? First one is a cockroach meeting. So if you have a cockroach in your bathroom, it's a small problem. You may not want to be the one who cleans it up, I get it, but it's a small problem. It's a single issue. So we have over 35 cockroach meetings a day at our company. Anyone can call a meeting. It is totally optional for people to show up. Of course, if you're the one who called it, you gotta, call, you gotta do it, but it is totally optional for anyone to show up. So you throw out a meeting invite, hey, I have this small problem. Who can help me with this? And you might throw it in your Slack, you might send out an email or meeting invite, whatever. Again, it's optional for people to show up. It is a 15 minute meeting max. One item, one agenda item. You must start on time, okay? So if the meeting was at 11, by 11.01 the meeting has started. You give the people you know, a little, 30 seconds, 45 seconds with technology, especially with everyone maybe going remote for the first time. But man, you're on it at 11.01, okay? We do not sit around and wait for people. This is a, a, a waste of everyone's time, a waste of company money, and sends the wrong message. You start right away. Hey guys, here's my issue. And the, whoever's on the call quickly talks about whatever that is, and then that's it. We always try to end meetings early. That's, that's a cognitive bias called Parkinson's Law that we often try to fill time. If we left 15 minutes for something, we try to take the whole 15 minutes. So we have a goal at People G2, end meetings early, have the gift of time. And so, um, and we don't talk about other things. We don't bring up other agenda items. If we need a meeting on something else, we call another meeting. People hop on, we work on this issue, we hang up. Our average cockroach meeting is eight minutes long right now. So imagine how much collaboration is happening. If you're quickly on a quick meeting, you hop on a Zoom call, you got eight people, you, get, you know, for eight minutes with five people, what well, you can get done, and then boom, it's, you're off and you're, you're going. The next meeting is very, very similar. All the same rules apply, 15 minutes, start on time, end early, option to show up, and what anyone can call it, okay? Ostrich meeting, which is, I don't know something, who can help me? Now, it's very common for me to have my sales team call me and say, geez, Chris, we have this big account. We're going to talking to them. It's a final meeting, and they want their CEO to come in and to have questions. We want you to be on the call. Great. But I'm like, I have no idea what you guys have talked about. Help me get my head out of this hand. And we'll schedule a meeting, and in 10, 15 minutes, they will fill me in on everything I need to know so I can, you know, go on that call and, and, and sound somewhat intelligent, um, mostly because they told me what I needed to say. So that's an ostrich meeting. But again, it's different. We're not problem solving. We're just getting information to somebody. Now, the next one is a tiger team meeting. Now, if you have a tiger in your bathroom, it's a much bigger problem. I mean, think about what you would have to do to get a tiger out of your bathroom. I need a dart gun, animal control, a crane. I mean, we would need a lot of resources and a lot of planning. It's the same thing with a tiger team meeting. So this meeting is called by a manager, a team leader, someone who's sort of in a leadership position. And it is probably going to be a 30 minute, an hour, two hour, all day long meeting, depends on what it is. There's gonna be a very intense agenda. We're gonna have a very clear idea of what we're talking about. And people are gonna bring preparation. They're gonna have done a lot of things to be ready for this meeting. Notice that we are giving people an indication of what is expected from them and what kind of meeting this is going to be. We're not asking people to just show up some random meeting that they don't know if they're supposed to be at or not, or there's any value for them, okay? And, and so we are respecting people's time. If they get an agenda from a Tiger Team meeting and they realize they don't need to be on there, they have the freedom to say, I don't think I should be in this meeting. You guys can just let me know what happened, but I don't have anything to contribute. This is not my area. Great, go do your work. You don't need to be in this meeting. Or we can articulate, well, we're really hoping you could do this thing for us, or, or, or share the, the, you know, information about this thing for us, great, well then we'll have them come in at only one part. It's a really clear way to set expectations. Now, the next one is a tsunami planning meeting, okay? So tsunami planning meeting is a what if meeting. Now, given our COVID-19, I mean, this is 
something people may have already thought about, what would happen if. So we um, do these meetings when we need them. We also do them a lot as practice. So, you know, go back and ask people, what would happen if you suddenly had to work from home? Do we have the tools? Do we have the things, right? What would happen if, you know, uh, the economy were to shift? What would happen if we landed this big, giant client? They can be good things. They can be bad things. But what I find is that people need practice having a disagreement, practice collaborating, practice arguing, practice being in a safer space where they can see that they're not going to be called stupid and no one's going to step all over them and they can talk about these things. So we, these are great. It can be 15-minute meetings. That's usually what I suggest. Get your team together, give them a topic, and have fun talking about something that hasn't happened yet to get them comfortable collaborating in this way. Okay. Um, the next one is feed forward. So if, as you start to have these different types of meetings, whether they're traditional or the remote, you may find that you have somebody who's not cooperating or is not, you know, collaborating in the best possible way. Maybe you have someone that's talking too much. Maybe someone who's interrupting all the time. Maybe you have someone whose dog is barking or, or they're, you know, constantly clicking on their keyboard while they're, they didn't mute themselves, right? Whatever it is that you need to share with them, ask them to do the, whatever it is you need going forward. So, hey, hey, Tom, in the next meeting, can you make sure that, you know, you got the dog put away or can you make sure that you have yourself on mute when you're not talking? It really helps us make sure we don't have a distraction. People take that kind of information really, really well because it is inherently positive. Feedback is inherently negative. Right? So if we ask, tell, hey, in that last meeting, the dog was barking, it was totally annoying, what the heck, man? That's negative, people get upset, they get defensive, they can't change the past. But if you go to them and ask them what, to do something different going forward, it's a really great way to do so, okay? Also, if your team needs to get together, they need a little more collaboration, have them one-on-one -on -one tell each other what they need from each other. You could come, it's like that, that uh, how are you showing up exercise. You could have everyone just share real quick, hey, what does everyone need from everyone in this meeting? Guys, I, I'm really not sure. I really need your help understanding this. Or I really need everyone to be open-minded about this idea. Whatever it is, feed forward is a really key way to get people to think and to be open about this and not to be scared to be collaborative and to talk and to, to, to share what they're really thinking. Um, okay, so I promised you we would get to some questions, and then I have a few last things to kind of round it off, some things that may help. There are some questions in here. Now, a few of you did ask some legal questions, and I'm going to tell you right now I'm not a lawyer. I don't play one on TV. I'm not giving legal advice. Um, I will try. If I can't, if there's anything I can try to tell you, um, I certainly will. So some, someone asked about AB5. Um, I don't have any answers on AB5. That's certainly up in the air. They're radically changing it right now. It's already been held up in court. So we do not have a specific strategy with independent contractors right now that I can share with you because all of that is sort of in the air. I certainly would refer you back to uh, SHRM and to um, uh, your attorney for a much better answer. Um, what are some of the best practices to help collaboration work with remote employees? I hope that those meeting types, uh, that is our best way. So strict meetings, Having meeting types is our really high level of collaboration for us, and I highly suggest that you take some, change the names, keep the names, I don't care, but, you know, having these different types of meetings helps people know what to call and when to call it. Um, so thank you for that question. Um, so do you, do you not have to follow California labor laws if someone works in Arizona for you? So again, I'm not a lawyer, but I will tell you here's what we do. I'm a California company. California tends to have the most strict laws. So we give everyone the California version in most cases. So if my California employees get more maternity or paternity leave than let's say Ohio, we give them what the, we just make it the same. So whatever is the highest, we just give it to everybody, like the same level. So we're not like giving eight weeks of paternity to California, but only four to Ohio. Like, that, and that's our personal choice. We want it to try to be as equitable for everyone as we can. Um, so that is what we try to do. Now, there could be some differences like that are not on, 
equal. It's just different. And so if they are like a New York employee, we might have to do something a little different because they are located in New York. Again, this is a little bit complicated, but go back and talk to your um, attorneys and your, your HR pros about this. But for the most part, we have found treating people at the, the highest standard has been a really good way for us to operate in most situations. Um, and, and just talking to our people about it, right? And being open and honest about it. So, um, but yeah, um, there is some, you know, differences. What do you have to do as a company located in state A? And then what do you have to do because they're an employee in other state B? Um, you're going to have to think that through. What is the cost of Slack or Teams? So Slack um, has a free version. Um, so you can get in there and start collaborating right away for free add all kinds of people, but it does have limitations on how many plugins, how many like outside things you can put in there. Um, and when you get over a certain amount of those and you got to start paying, I think it's six or seven dollars an employee a month. It's very affordable. I think it's, it is the most, you know, the best thing I spend money on every month for our employees for collaboration. So I highly suggest that you check that out, but you can go check it out and have your employees start playing around with it for free, which is great. Um, I don't know about Teams. I think that and uh, you can get Teams if you have uh, Office 365. As far as I remember last, there is a cost for that. I think no matter what, it could be a free version, but check it out. Um, uh, let's see. So uh, someone said how many people. I'm not sure what that was meant for as far as, so maybe you could reiterate how many people for what. Uh, I think that was from Ann, if you could let me know. Um, someone asked me, will we be recording, will there be a recording of this in the future? Yes, we are recording this now. We will be sending this to every person on who, uh, and everyone who uh, uh, registered, and you are welcome to share it with anyone you'd like. Uh, and then if you would like a copy of the slides, like in PDF or something, um, let me know. You can, here's my email address. You can send me a note and I can send those to you. Um, and then, um, Great. And then, okay, so the question was how many employees do we have? How do you track hours of employees? So we do have a uh, plugin in Slack and allows hourly employees to clock in and clock out and also to clock in their breaks and their lunches. Um, I'm forgetting now the uh, name of that program. Mike, if you remember what it is and can send it to me in Slack, I'll tell everyone what it is in a moment. Um, but we do have that program for all of our hourly employees, anyone that you want to track their time, it works great. And it creates a uh, time card for them, an Excel spreadsheet. They can open it. They can make sure they didn't miss anything. It's all accurate and then send it off to payroll or their, uh, uh, their, their, uh, their, their manager, excuse me. Oh, the program is called Attendance Bot. And I do think we pay like a few bucks or something a month for each employee to have that plug in. Um, and so attendance bot is great and it tracks everyone's hours and it's like, you know, the easiest thing in the world. Um, and then, uh, let's see. Um, thank you. So many, so many great notes about, um, uh, presentation, uh, about the information. So thank We were just so happy we can provide this. So thank you everyone for being here. Um, and let's see, it uh, looks like there's some more. May okay, thank you so much. Uh, great information. Uh, let's see, what else do we have? What about verifying that hourly employee is actually working, not just to clock in and clock out? So listen, again, this is back to knowing, being able to track. So we have hourly employees that are doing a certain like tactical work and we have goals for them. Um, let's just say they need to do a certain amount of verifications per hour. They're working X amount of hours. They should have a certain amount of output. Their managers are looking at that, and if they're if it dips up or comes up, goes high or low, they're having conversations about that, right? So we have a clear idea of what we expect from them, what we think that that looks like, and we are com looking at that every pay period and kind of quickly comparing: is everything look kosher, and are we happy there? And for us, that works, right? Um, we try not to do too much of that because we find again, the more we're like staring down at them going, are you really working? Like the, it's like passive aggressive teenagers and they're not working, right? And the more trust we give them, the more leeway we get them to go do their work and do a great job, the better off it is. So that works best from us uh, uh, all the time. Uh, we have had people that, you know, it was obvious they were 
turning in hours that were not legit, right? And so we had conversations, we termed those people, and we make sure everyone knows in the company what's going on and 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 that people need to be truthful and 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 turning good hours. And so we have a really good practice around that. Um, great. So um, how do you start this kind of remote system uh, when before everyone was working in an office? And we'll later again. So I think all of this can carry over, right? You can put this collaboration in. Uh, I'm, I'm also happy a lot of people have asked me to come and do consulting works. So if you need something you know, more hands on, I'm happy to talk to you about that. But you can put these things into place and then carry them on later on, even when you come back and even allow people some flex part time remote work. I think remote work is going to be the future. The more you can allow it, the better and happier employees are going to be anyways. So start with the meeting types. Those meeting types can work no matter where you are. Start with those. Right? That's a really great way to start collaborating and talking and having better meetings with everyone. Um, okay, so uh, keep asking questions if you have them. I just have a few more things here. I know we're at the, the hour mark here, but if you want to stay on, I did have a few more things to tell you. Um, make sure this is this really cool thing that James Clear talked about called the aggregation of marginal gains. And, and, and basically what this means is, and I have a really cute story, but we're out of time. I'll just tell you exactly what it means, which is, you can only try to get a little bit better at a time. So don't try to go get 100% better today. Try to get 1% better. Go back and talk to your team and your people and say, how can we get 1% better at our remote work today or our collaboration today? And how do we not get 1% worse? Or how do we not do anything that's gonna make it worse for anybody? Okay? So, um, you know, try to make sure that you're thinking about it every day. And so every day that goal is how do we get a little bit better and a little bit better and a little bit better and not get any, any worse. This is how the British cycling team became one of the best in the world by just asking themselves this question every single day. You know, what's the thing we can do? And today they talked about tower, higher pressure and the next day it was about sleep. And the next day it was about staying healthy. And so they did little things at a time. You can do that. Uh, and that is the best way for everyone while they're overwhelmed and all this change and things going on is just to ask, how do we get a little bit better today and not get a little bit worse today? And you will find that approach to be easy for your people to manage, easy for them to digest, and not overwhelming for you and everyone else in the company. Um, great. So, um, you know, we we'll want to make sure we, um, uh, oh, there's a few more calls. So, um, who answers your phone calls? So great question. We use a phone system. You can use Ring Central. That's a great one to use for remote work. We use Macergy. Whatever VoIP system we have, um, they can route calls everywhere to where you want it to go. And then we have call things. So it goes in and goes to our calls, our different customer service people, or if you ask for sales, it calls sales. They all have a little VoIP uh, thing on their computer. So um, Ring Central is probably the easiest and least expensive one. Um, you just have to figure out the, you know, the forwarding. But you could forward your main line to like your Ring Central line that you create. Like you could have it up today, and then you can create, you know, where who calls and create directories for everyone. Super easy to use, um, and it has a little module that can be on their computer and on their cell phones for mobile redundancy. Great questions, you guys. Um, and so make sure that no matter what you do. You are tying this to your BHAG, your big, hairy, audacious goal. And maybe your big, hairy, audacious goal right now is to survive this COVID-19 crap and for you guys to come out better for it, right? Set a big goal that, and, and make sure everyone knows it, everyone understands it. It's so much easier to put up with all the crap in the world and everything that's going on if you've done that. So make sure people understand your goals. Make sure you've, you've been transparent about them. You've shared them. And they, they know why you're asking them to do these things. Okay, um, last chance for questions. Here again is my contact information. Please make sure that you email me here. Um, um, someone jokingly said, uh, what do you use for fax service? But we actually do have fax. People do fax us. We use e-fax uh, to manage that for us. Um, so people do have to fax us documents sometimes, and we do have to fax stuff out. So um, we really do do that. Um, here's my contact information. If you want a copy of the presentation by PDF, that is where you have to email. We will be sending the recording of this presentation to all of you who registered, so don't worry about that. Um, and 
And if last but not least, if you would like to know more about People G2, who's our company who uh, put this on and was the reason we were able to do this, we do background checks, drug testing. Uh, if you need help with any of that, we are your source and we'd love to help you. So you can certainly reply back to that email and let us know. We're happy to help. Um, if you have questions, if anyone else you know uh, needs um, help in anything that we can help you with, while everyone's going through this, we certainly are happy to be a resource. And last but not least, someone asked if I'm wearing pants. And I don't know if you can, but yes, I am wearing pants today. Because remember, we get dressed, we don't wear pajamas. We, uh, you know, it's important, so wear pants. And you never know when they, when you might, might uh, someone might see you on camera. So anyways, thank you everyone so much for being a part of this. Uh, stay strong, wash your hands, stay inside, be strong, and if we can help you in any way, we are here to be a resource. Good luck with being remote, and if you're like me, you're going to love it, and your people are going to love it, and you're going to come out of this even stronger. So uh, best of luck to everyone. Thank you so much. Bye.